This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live on a given Wednesday afternoon. The, the day before the hurricane's supposed to hit the Big Island, Hurricane Lane. Ooh. Okay, and we're going to talk about that today here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Maria Tomei is our co-host today. Hi, Maria. Hi, Dave. <laughs> You're great. And uh, we have Shannon Tanganon. She is communications director of Hawaiian Electric Company, and we are delighted to have her here with us. Thanks for coming down, Shannon. Thanks for having me. I know me. you're busy. Appreciate it. Okay. And on the phone, we have uh, Chris Burgess. He's with Rocky Mountain Institute, and uh, he wrote a, a, a report we want to talk about uh, called Solar Under Storm. That's a pretty catchy title. Welcome to the show, Chris. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks. Okay, first up, uh, Shannon, um, you probably want to tell us something about preparedness, being prepared for this extreme weather coming soon. Well, I, yes, we definitely want everyone to be prepared, but we also want to set expectations. I mean, if this storm, you know, continues on the track, it, you know, on this track, and we just want to make sure that people are aware that anytime we have heavy winds, torrential rain, flooding, there is going to be the possibility, highly likely possibility, that there will be outages. So we just want people to plan ahead and make sure that they're prepared for that. How does it work? The, the, the heavy winds push things around like towers and lines? Yeah, well, it pushes lines sometimes. It also, you know, will trigger um, limbs to fall on our lines, you know, that could cause a short. I mean, there's just fallen trees, all kinds so, of It's yeah. hard to say where and when. Yeah. I guess the thing you worry about mostly are the big transmission lines because that affects more people than the little ones. Definitely, definitely. Most of our generation is on in central Oahu or leeward Oahu, so we just want to make sure that everything is secured in those areas. We're, we've been preparing all week. What have you been doing? I'm really curious because I want to join the company. You know. <laughs> sure. We're really um, tracking, of course. We, we meet every day. Um, we are trying our best to mobilize crews to where we feel like oh, we, we need. Identify um, the locations. Identify remote. the remote areas. Maui Electric, for instance, is, is identifying remote areas and sending employees to that area because we know it'll be difficult to get to these places after the storm has passed. So. We're trying to strategically put people where they need to be, equipment where, they, where it needs to be. I yeah, I, I mean, that's pretty exciting and threatening and stressful. Well, it is. And, you know, what we, you know we're hoping for the best outcome. Um, we just yeah, maybe don't, it'll we're pass caring us by. for the worst. If it's not coming directly over us, it, 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 at worst, it's coming nearby, not over us yet. Yeah, but, it, you know, the wind know. and the know. rain and the flooding, you know, that could take a toll. So what are you going to be doing while this all happens? We have a 24-hour um, shift. I mean, we have 12, two 12-hour 12 shifts. We're in emergency mode at this point. We have our, we're activating all our emergency action plans. You know, we, we have operations folks, planning folks, you know, our communication people. Yeah. Everyone has an like assignment. It's a military operation. Yeah, Everybody's everyone has an assignment. Everybody's in touch on, on radio and telephone. Whatnot. Yeah, we have satellite phones. You know, and you mobilize all the, all the trucks, all the linemen trucks, to go wherever they have to go. Yeah, I mean, but we don't go until it's absolutely safe for them to go. Yeah. And that's key for us. So where, where do you get your data from to, to know where the storm is and how it's affecting different parts of the island? We actually get on a call every morning with the National Weather Service, and then we have folks who definitely track it throughout the day um, just so that we're we're well aware of its track where it's headed yeah. what time we think it might hit certain areas so well if you can get there fast you know with the right equipment and the right skills um, you can m minimize ameliorate the risk and the damage that might otherwise happen right yeah definitely and we want to emphasize too that we've done a lot of work replacing wood poles, replacing 
wood poles with steel structures in some instances. We've done about in one. In the normal course, you yeah, do this all the time. Yeah, we've spent, spent about $1.5 billion over the last seven years wow. trying to make these types of improvements so that when you know, we have severe weather, we're, we can weather the storm much better. Yeah. So what would you like to leave with the people today? If there was one message that you wanted to give them on behalf of the utility, what would you tell them they should be thinking about and doing in the two, three days to come? There's camera one. Okay, well, we just want people to understand that there will be power outages if there's severe weather. So we just ask that you prepare for that, you know, mentally prepare yourself as well because, you know, there's just, you have to be patient. Um, you know, we, we're going to work as quickly as we can, but we're going to be as safe as we can as yeah. well. And I guess part of that is stay at home. Am I right? Exactly. Going out may not be a yeah, great idea. That's not a good idea. A no, because you'll have the roads might not be clear. And I would just hunker down. Yeah. yeah. Maria, what would you add to all of this? Well, thank you very much for, <laughs> for coming. Yeah, I know it's a very stressful time for everybody. Uh -huh. um, and the other thing, too, is as you prepare, um, be mindful that sometimes you're, you are trying to prepare for the worst. Um, but you really should also take into account safety. You know, exactly. you don't need to be getting up on your roof right now to check stuff. Mm -hmm. Don't don't do that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's adrenaline, there's a stress. I want to be doing something. Mm -hmm. You know, you're moving heavy things or whatever. You know, just be careful because very often people get injured um, yeah. in doing things in that are out of the again. normal. You know, and they don't realize it. As I said, there's an adrenaline thing yeah. going. Same mm -hmm. thing with driving. You know, drive with aloha. You know, if the the lights if are the out, cars are off, you know, if we're if off. we're off the road, then the emergency responders or the people who are preparing for the storm can get where they're going more efficiently and drive. You know, just be patient. Try to keep yourself calm. That's very good advice. Yeah. In case you didn't think about it, charge your cell phone. It's smart to do that. If you have spare batteries, charge them up now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you have batteries for your cell phone, charge them up, because in fact, the, the carriers all have backup electrical mm -hmm, systems mm -hmm. if the power goes out for them so they can continue to operate and if you know your cell phone works you can use it if the towers are up yeah How thank you shannon <laughs> thank you so shannon much shannon tanganon from uh, hawaiian electric great to have you here as always good to be here uh, thank you i hope everything goes okay oh we hope so too <laughs> we're gonna think positive <laughs> thank you shannon thank you <laughs> okay we'll be right back in one minute and we're going to spend some time with Chris Burgess about his report, which was made uh, around what happened in Puerto Rico. Yeah? Yep. Okay, we'll be right back. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me. Hi, I'm Dave Stevens, the uh, host of Cyber Underground, uh, every Friday here at 1 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. And then every episode is uploaded to the Cyber Underground, that library of shows that you can see of mine on youtube.com. And uh, I hope you'll join us here every Friday. We have some topical discussions about why security matters and what could scare the absolute bejesus out of you if you just try to watch my show all the way through. Hope to see you next time on the Cyber Underground. Stay safe. Okay, we're back. We're live with Maria Tomei, my co-host here in the studio. And um, on, on Zoom, uh, Chris Burgess joins us from, where are you, Chris, anyway? Uh, I'm in Washington, D.C. Ah, okay, I knew yeah. that. Yeah. From Washington, D.C., and uh, he's uh, with the Rocky Mountain Institute, and he's the author or co-author of a very important report, which we should look at right now, okay. in advance of Lane, the hurricane. Yeah, well, yeah, so um, I should um, introduce the idea here that um, when I, I saw this report that came out in June, and when we were gonna be talking about sustainability and preparedness and resilience, I thought I'd really like to talk to Chris about this report. So um, I called him up and said, or actually it was email, and said, hey, you know, 
we'd like to hear more about how to design your systems, your solar farms, to be more resilient. Um, because you've done this interesting report going to Puerto Rico and had some very um, down-to-earth, practical um, lessons from that. I had no idea we would be sitting here the day <laughs> before the hurricane lane arrived, but um, so it's it's timely. It's, it's, it's the yeah. perfect storm, as they say. Oh God! I, I hope it. <laughs> I hope this is all overblown and nothing you know serious happens uh, with our with our hurricane uh, here. But I did want to thank you very much um, for joining us, Chris. I guess we've got your picture, and we're going to be showing some photos from your. Um, report you here. Them, you show the, uh, Once again, the here's the like. here's the report. That's it's free. Report. It's on and the Rocky in the middle. Rocky Mountain Institute has it on their website, um, so it is it is available for download. It's only about 30, 33 pages, but it's very good. But so the pictures are it's, really shocking. Yeah. So um, the pictures are fantastic. So Chris. Thank you so much for your work on this report and for joining us today. I'd like to start with the photo on the cover. So that's the first image we have. And um, if you could tell us about this photo, please. Yeah, sure. I mean, what might be helpful is just some background. Um, the most active hurricane seasons we've had uh, was 2017 and, and, you know, almost 50 years. Um, and I want to say the Caribbean was almost lulled to sleep a little bit. Uh, the last really active hurricane season was way back in 2005. We can think back to Hurricanes Rita and Katrina and uh, the tragedies that happened uh, in New Orleans. And that was really the last time we've had this much devastation in one season. Uh, and back then, we didn't have a lot of renewable energy systems. Um, fast forward, you know, uh, was it 13 years? Um, and now you've got a plethora of renewable energy systems all around the Caribbean um, and just kind of a different mindset on energy to begin with. Uh, and now you have all this devastation. And, you know, intuitive you would think that these, you know, flimsy, you know, aluminum racks and these, you know, panels literally made of glass would just shatter and be blown away. And that did happen. Uh, as you can tell by the photo here, which is taken on St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands, but there was an amazing amount of survivorship in the in the Caribbean as well, and we really scratched our heads and wanted to know why. Uh, so we hired uh, three structural engineers to take uh, multiple site visits to both surviving and and failed systems. Um, so this is how we come up with all the data for solar under storm. Excellent, thanks. And so the next picture, page 13 of the can, report. Can we go back to that first picture for a minute? Sure. That first picture, yeah. really daunting. So um, it looks like two things happened. One is the solar panels were ripped off their tracks um, almost at random. Uh, and the second thing that it looks like from that picture is the tracks themselves were twisted and, and um, you know, uh, uh, bent in many places, and I, I wonder. Uh, um, this is and this is the worst of it, I guess. First of all, that scene, what we're looking at on the cover of your report, that doesn't work, right? There's no <laughs> way any electrical power is going to be generated from that mess, right? That's correct. Yeah, that this one was complete de devastation, and unfortunately, this project. Um, was really haunted, but with several, um, you know, missteps. The first one is um, that many of the bottom through bolts uh, that were supposed to hold the, uh, the bottom rack to the solar modules were actually not torqued, or some of them were completely missing. Ooh. So it was really workmanship where they did not actually complete the job to spec, and there wasn't... Um, good uh, owner's rep or engineering's representation um, in, in terms of checking off, um, you know, all the workmanship that needed to be done to, to sign off on this project. The other thing that happened was because of the, the clamps that they did use, uh, what you see is what's called cascading failure. So when, when mon one module goes, it shares a clamp with the next module, so it's kind of like dominoes when they go off. 
Um, so anyway, they, uh, this, this cover is kind of littered with all kinds of, you know, uh, do nots, and, and that's pretty explicit in the report. Mm. Yeah. So the next picture that I find very interesting is on page 13 um, that shows what looks like a devastated field at the top and a pretty intact one at the bottom. Can you tell us about that one? Yeah, so two things happened here. One, there was a topography difference um, that you can see with the, with the kind of graded hillside there that's vegetated. Um, the other thing is they actually used um, two different sets of modules on this. Oh. Um, so they didn't have one mo module manufacturer for the entire farm. Um, and so literally half the farm is one ma module manufacturer with one clamping system to the racks, uh, and the other one is uh, a totally different brand and a totally different mechanism for fastening the modules to the racks. Wow, that is a significant difference. Yeah. But let me yeah. ask you, is, is there any, any chance that any part of this farm was actually producing electricity at, with this damage as we see? Yeah, yeah, actually about uh, a third of it powered back up. Uh, wow. Unfortunately, though, this is a, it, this is a grid-connected uh, solar farm in, in southern Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, and because PREPA was down for so many months, this could not actually produce power for the grid. So that's actually the, you know, that, that'll happen in Hawaii too with, with homes that don't have battery storage. Yeah. They, cannot, they cannot island uh, without the electricity company being on. Yeah. Uh, be, you haven't had the grid powered up because the inverters have to sense voltage from the grid in order to operate. Very interesting. Yeah. Unless, of yeah. course, the system has been designed to, to have a separate circuit. So, yeah. yeah, unless you have a yeah. separate critical yeah. facility right. circuit. Right, yeah. yeah. I, I'm wondering in the report, did you identify the manufacturer of the, of the panels that failed and the manufacturer of the panels that, that succeeded? No, we, we left brand names out of this. Uh, report and we just went with specifications for what's called uh, Pascal loading, which is really the downward pressure on the panel and then the uplift pressure on the panel. And you'll see in the recommend recommendations that we recommend a 5400 Pascal uplift rating, which is one of the highest on the tier one market for modules. So we can't name names, but we can name specifications. And then you can okay. figure then the yeah. Then the developer can figure out which, which guys to use and which guys not to use. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, there's a number of manufacturers that do 5400 uplift rating. Yeah, right, got it. Okay, okay so then, um, you know, there were a lot of systems that um, were looked at and a lot of information. So on page 15, there was a fishbone diagram that illustrated how much they looked at, you know, different, eight different categories of failure modes being grouped together. Everything from materials to equipment to construction methods to people to environment to system design to codes and standards and business model. So I think this, um, this is very useful to project developers. Of course, we don't have time today to go into it, but also to the insurance companies and the operators of the system. You know, maybe we can come back to this later if we have time or some other day. Um, <coughs> but I do think that your perspective on how many different things need to be thought about is very useful, and I like the way you organize the report. Um, so I'd, I'd like to take this up again another time. I, I noticed there are some that are bolded, and I assume that those were the more significant um, issues? Uh, the, the, those are the ones that we observed uh, oh, in the okay. field. Oh, OK, OK. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so, okay. And, and, we, and we, we built out the, the fish bone and uh, what were called um, other factors or what's called lurking failures. So there was a failure that happened, but if that failure didn't happen, is there something looming behind it? It's almost like a mechanical fuse. Oh. Right? Yeah. So, so let's, say the, let's say the modules had 5,400 Pascal rating. Let's say they were through bolted, everything were fine but then there was no lateral bracing on the rack. Yeah. And the whole rack, the whole rack pushed over like a pancake. Oh dear. Right, so that, that, would, be, that would be a lurking failure, yeah. where as the modules were fine, but the rack itself could not hold that pressure from, a, from an east-west 
yeah. uh, was, you know, east-west force, so it, it folded. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's why this uh, fishbone is kind of built out the way it is. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Okay, so the next um, photo is another one showing some panels that survived and some that didn't. Is this similar? Is this one field that had two different types of modules? or? This yeah, well, th this was a combination of um, um, just some lack of workmanship. There was, you know, there were some untorqued um, fasteners. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually switched, they actually switched fastener methodology halfway through the project. So the modules are the same brand, oh. but the way they fastened them to the, the rack changed. Jeez, we, okay, people should be out checking bolts on their solar farms yeah. right hey. now. Were, were, was the first hey. system, uh, was the first system more successful than the second, or was the second system more successful than the first? Um, I don't know what the sequence was. All I know is um, that y you see the racks are fine in that picture. Yeah. It's really just the modules that were uplifted. Yeah. Um, the clamps basically failed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. So this was actually a, an easy one to repower um, because all of the electrical infrastructure was fine. The structural infrastructure was fine. It was really just the modules themselves that need to be reattached. Cool. Okay. So um, this brings us to my favorite feature of your report, which is the useful tables by topic with the most important failure modes, mitigation actions, and relative cost and impact. So the next graphic yeah. is um, page 19. Shows some low cost, high impact types of failures that it seems um, Maybe with three, day, three days advance notice of a hurricane company coming, sorry, it could make some difference if some trained operators of a solar farm went out to check for loose bolts. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, just really little stuff like that and, you know, just getting a lot of the free debris away from the solar field. Um, debris can get picked up and, you know, smash on the panels. Um, you know, torquing and, and checking the, the bolt torquing is obviously important. And, Sometimes you have a few days notice to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, but really, most of this stuff has to happen during installation. You have to have proper uh, owner's representation checks before the signed off and the final payments for the, for the contractor. That's really where you're going to get the best thing for your buck. But there are, like you mentioned, some maintenance things that you can regularly perform. We even um, were uh, contemplating doing some guy wire um, uh, anchors in the ground, you know, those helical screws, yeah. put those in the ground uh, to the north and the south of the rack and then do trucking straps. So the same straps that, you know, trucks would use on tractor trailers, uh, which are canvas and, and have the ratcheting system. Yeah, you I was going to ask you about that. The yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so did you learn, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the way these farms were set up, did you learn whether the the placement of the panels and the racks was, was ideal, or did you learn that perhaps it should have been, they should have been placed in a different direction uh, or a different contouring on the land? Um, did you ever get into that? And, and my second part of that is, um, did, you, did you learn whether it would have been useful, aside from the guy wires, that sounds pretty good, um, if, the, the, if the developer built um, protective, protective areas around the side of the farm to protect the w against the wind coming and sweeping under the racks. Uh, any, any thought given to that? A protective barrier of some kind of wall um, or a, a, um, some kind of barrier so that the wind could not get under the racks. Right, yeah. And so, you know, you and I have a very, um, what we think is an intuitive mitigation, right? And I ask that same thing to these structural engineers and they smirk at each other. And and what you're doing is you're adding a ton of costs because you have to build basically a, a brick or a, you know, center block or concrete wall. Um, so it's an enormous amount of cost for a lot of these large utility scale solar farms. And you're really actually exacerbating some of the wind um, features on, mm -hmm. on the on the plant itself. Mm -hmm. So what these Structural designers do, and I learned this along the way, um, is they actually design the rack, and then they put it into, you know, like a 3D model wind tunnel, like a virtual model, uh, and then they can see on that rack from various directions where the weak points are in that rack, and then they will design 
to the topography um, and to the highest wind load uh, of that particular standard. Now, the Caribbean was mostly Category 4, but after Irma and Maria, now everyone wants to build a Category 5. Mm. Um, so you're talking about 155 mile an hour plus. So that, that's what these structural engineers are doing. What we try to outline is some of the design stuff that you should be making with your racking manufacturer and your structural engineer, but also just some simple best practices. Um, I think the best bang for the buck is really using through bolting. So instead of using clamps, you actually through bolt the modules to the rack itself mm. and use a proper uh, torquing method and um, uh, something that's called nylock that keeps the bolts from vibrating loose. Because there's a ton of vibration action on these. And then that can loosen the, loosen the nut in the bolt, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then once that happens, you get these cascading failures, which is a lot of the optics that you see in these pictures. So what about the uh, what about the more detailed? And I, Maria has shown me two copies of the report. One is a fairly abbreviated. Oh, well, that's just my notes. Less abbreviated. <laughs> and then this one's but this is the actual. Neither of them has you yeah. know your scientific data, test uh, results, <laughs> um, you know detailed documentation. Is there is there a third copy of the report, Chris? No, like I said, we, we were not trying to replace any of the, um, you know, any of the engineering standards like, you know, Miami-Dade wooden coats or anything that, yeah. like that. We were basically identifying best practices and literally identifying what we saw as failure modes um, in the last two hurricanes that hit the Caribbean. So um, we view this as an informing document for the insurers uh, and for government and other jurisdictions that are going to set wind standards. Um, we, the purpose of this report was not to go into um, detail. Now, for one, we didn't have the budget, uh, and two, that's really not what the Rocky Mountain Institute wants to do. We want to make sure that we get the best information to other decision makers that, that do this for a living. I'm curious also, the report was, uh, the photographs were taken, the report was written, when, a few months ago? Uh, no, we started. We invest, We started our investigation um, in late November. Um, field work concluded uh, after the holidays, I guess, early February, uh, and then we collaborated with several authors from February to about May, um, and then I think we finally released the the print version in June. So we, we were trying to make that. We were trying to make that June first uh, start of hurricane season deadline. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, is it fair to say that the damage that is shown in these photographs has, has all been repaired by now? Uh, no, it's not fair to say. Um, you know, many of the, of the solar farms in, in Puerto Rico, um, you know, are still under either litigation or um, still waiting on insurance money. Um, but uh, let's see, Anguilla has an RFP up now to repower theirs. That one has not been replaced yet. Um, Turks and Caicos and, and BDI both were survivors. I mean, they had less than 5% of their modules were uplifted or damaged, so they, they have been repowered. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of a mixed bag, to say the truth, Jay. Mm. Maria, you have, you have a couple more pictures, you know. Yeah, yeah, so there were a couple more tables. I don't know that we have much time, but they have pictures, too. So the next table, page 20 had um, mm -hmm. mentioned something about trackers in uh, item 3A, number 5, close to 5. Specify trackers included in the project be designed for worst case wind exposure, no stow position for extreme wind allowed. So I just had a quick question. Um, is the, the trackers with a stow position are bad, or they're supposed to do their analysis without assuming that it's able to avoid the wind? Do, do, do you know, or is uh, that just one of those? No. Yeah, this, this really came from um, FCX Solar. They, they used to work for Sun Edison, and they do um, a ton of renewable energy consulting around um, solar structures. Yeah. And we, we do not have a lot of trackers in the Caribbean. Um, I've got 26 projects in the Caribbean, and none of them are trackers. Oh, okay. Um, tra so we didn't actually have any field work on uh, trackers. They added that because... It's kind of a misconception with some of the developers that they can go in stow mode 
um, and that's going to be safe. Okay. So, so it's not necessarily necessarily okay. safe. It's not a free pass. Um, all right. As yeah. you as you can see, and um, you know the picture on the cover, you know the tilt on that on, the tilt on that project is extremely low. Yeah. Probably you know five five percent. Yeah. Which would be the equivalent equivalent of a stow mode. Yeah. Um, and tracker. And, and that and didn't you see the damage. Yeah. Right. right. Okay, so the next table from page 21 shows um, a problem very common in Hawaii with corrosion. Um, was this a major impact in Puerto Rico? Um, a lot of the the um, installations in Puerto Rico were, were fairly new, so we actually didn't see a ton of corrosion there. That corrosion picture um, comes from a system on U.S. Virgin Islands that had been there for, I want to say, six years. Um, and as you can see, obviously, it, it didn't use the, the proper galvanization, yeah. um, a, a proper material there, and that just vibrated, literally vibrated loose. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, th it, this, um, thanks so much for putting together the report. And it gives a lot of insights, especially for those of us who have not personally been through a direct hit of a major hurricane. Uh, for example, and we don't have a graphic for this, but on page 23, item 60 says, rain intrusion into combiner boxes or inverters, um, even if it meets NEMA specification, is hurricane wind blowing sideways can penetrate NEMA 3. So I, I guess, yeah. yeah, there are a lot of things that you can um, improve, you know, just the waterproofing of things. Just think horizontal rain um, driven at uh, high, high rates of speed are going to get into areas it shouldn't get Given into. Given the findings and the recommendations yeah. of this report, um, what, what's your advice to Hawaii on the eve of its own hurricane tomorrow? What, um, what, you know, what, what should we learn? What, what would you advise us to be conscious of from this report? Uh, you know, well, first of all, obviously, you know, human health and safety is first and foremost. Take care of your families. Um, stay indoors. You know, all the the level-headed advice that we heard in your earlier segment um, is, is front and center. Uh, in terms of solar, there's probably not much you can do right now. Um, but in the aftermath, it would be interesting to learn, um, you know, depending on the amount of uh, extreme wind events that you do get on the Big Island, um, what survived and what failed. And then we can kind of, you know, Look into we'll look into why that happened. Um, there are several things that you can probably do after the storm. Uh, it's just to make sure you didn't have any water penetration on your inverters or your combiner boxes. Um, you know, make sure that system's powered down before you do look at that. Uh, go back and check the um, the bolts and the rack. Make sure it, it hasn't vibrated itself loose, so you don't have loose nuts and bolts. Um, these are all good, you know, operation and maintenance uh, tasks that you can do uh, before and after a storm. Um, and then what we really, you know, claim in this report is this isn't a Bible um, that is going to guarantee any type of survival. It's more of a start of a collaboration. So we've actually got a working group uh, on a website called CARIC. It's the Caribbean Renewable Energy Community. Um, we've got members from over 60 countries all around the world. We'd be happy to invite um, Hawaii to that as well. We, we really want to learn from, from more data. Uh, Jay, as you mentioned, you know, this, this is um, devoid of direct data, and, and, and that's on purpose. You know, we want to make sure that we keep a, a really open source database um, from all over the world so we can continue to improve the resiliency of these renewable energy systems. Because when they are when they are resilient, they're extremely powerful. Uh, one of the, the major crises in Puerto Rico, as we're uncovering all these investigations there, is not really that the, the power was down, is that the services that power provides were down, right? Mm -hmm. So your medical yeah. services, um, your water pumping, your water treatment, you ultimately was responsible for over 99% of the deaths in the storm. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the preparation from the water facilities uh, was there in terms of having gasoline and diesel backup generators. But when they, they were cut off from their fuel supply, after a few days, the water stopped pumping. If those water treatment systems and those water pumping stations had solar and storage microgrids, 
that could survive the storm, then they would have water for, you know, four to six hours a day mm -hmm. um, without PREPA coming back on. Well, one, thing, one, coming back on. Well, one thing is clear is that whenever you have a storm these days in the new world of extreme weather, you have to make this kind of analysis after. <coughs> you have to learn from everything so that the next time you're better prepared. So your report is That's very right. important to us, yes. <coughs> and so is your appearance on our show, Chris. Um, thanks, yeah. thanks for coming yeah. down. Maria, thanks for setting it up. Thanks. Unfortunately, we're out of time, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. we are. Yeah. But we, but we can schedule um, more discussion later, maybe after we see what uh, Hurricane Lane right. does or doesn't do to um, some of our systems. And as you mentioned, there's a lot being built and a lot of potential with the solar and microgrid and the backup and the more resilient system that we are going to be developing this for a long time. Thank you, Chris. Chris That's Burgess, great. Rocky Mountain Institute. Thank Thanks. you so much for appearing on our show. Thank you both, and you guys stay safe. Okay. Thanks, Thank Chris. You. Aloha. Bye. Bye.